Okay. <clears throat> My name is Matthew J. Campanella, and uh, I worked uh, initially at RCA in uh, River Road in Building 53. Uh, this was about uh, the time wise, about 1952, 51, 52. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, <clears throat> my, one of my first assignments was really relating to uh, waveguides. Uh, I had studied uh, waveguides and so forth. I uh, had a master's degree from uh, Harvard where I studied waveguides. Eventually, in that connection, eventually I got a PhD degree from Penn while working at RCA. But anyway, I had this background in waveguides, which was, of course, a fundamental aspect of radars. And I worked, uh, this was in Building 53 on River Road. And uh, I maybe worked on that for about six months. And for some reason or other, they needed some people in, uh, in displays. And I got transferred over to displays and things of that sort in the radar system. We worked at uh, River Road for about two years until eventually they moved from there to Morristown. Mm -hmm. And of course that was a big event for us guys who were there. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar, anyone is familiar with River Road, but the building uh, dated back to World War I. But it was pretty crude. You come in in the morning, plus the fact that it was in a uh, industrial area. So every morning you came in, your desk, uh, your desk was half covered with soot. So you go to the process in addition to going to work, you, you were going to clean up what we would eat. But, uh, and also we didn't have much space in the sense of, for radars, you really need space, a lot of space. So they were very limited in what we could do at uh, River Road. And from the day one, the idea was that they would move, we would move somewhere. And eventually we did move, move to Morristown. They had looked at several locations. Uh, one was Gibbsboro, if any of you are familiar with it. <clears throat> it seems RCA did own some property in Gibbsboro, but it was not large enough. And our radar systems and the testing of them you really need plenty of space. And they did find a good chunk of space there at Morristown. The other requirement was uh, uh, that you had to be on a kind of a railroad. The thought initially was that you maybe would uh, ship your equipment or parts of equipment via rail. And as it turned out, <laughs> As far as I can remember, they never did use the railroad, even though that was initially a requirement to be on a rail. And as you, any of you, of you who are familiar with uh, <clears throat> the Morristown plant, you'll notice there's a railroad there. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the guiding things when they are looking for a location, is to be on or very near to a railroad, even though they never hardly used it. Uh, the move to uh, the Morristown plant occurred <coughs> about, 19, <coughs> about September 1953, as I recall correctly. And we were uh, not too large a group from uh, Camden. And uh, originally, the, the building or the space there was a asparagus field. And when we uh, moved there, one of the favorite pastimes for some of the employees was to go out during lunch break and cut themselves some asparagus for dinner that night. But anyway, getting back to the main product line, which was uh, tracking uh, radars. And uh, the first primary program that I was involved in <clears throat> was the uh, Talos radar which was a competition between uh, RCA <clears throat> and uh, uh, Bell Labs. Uh -huh. I think it was for the Nike uh, missile system. It was a competition and uh, it uh, gave us, I guess, our real first chance of coming up with a, uh, a tactical system. Uh, but unfortunately, while we thought we were great, uh, Bell Labs beat us out in a fine competition. 
The aspect of the radar systems that I eventually got involved in had to do with the display part, the monitors and so forth, plus a lot of uh, research and development. Uh, I got, uh, they, they sized me up, I guess, as a fellow who could do with research, and I ended up doing a lot of it. But uh, initially, uh, I was involved primarily after my short time with waveguides back with displays. Uh, I had uh, gained some background at Harvard with nonlinear circuits. And by the way, in those days, uh, we worked with vacuum tubes. And, uh, you know, I guess uh, to the engineer today, that's really uh, an unknown. They don't even know what it is. Uh, by my way of comparison, uh, eventually, I, I'll, I'll hold off on that. Uh, eventually, I ended up uh, being assigned to uh, digital technology. This was a new technology. And my group leader one day uh, uh, called me in, and he says they were creating a, a new digital technology group, and he wanted me to head it up. And that's when I became group leader and eventually unit manager. And we were pioneering the use of technology, of digital technology. But the digital technology that we started out with would be uh, not recognizable by the digital technologists of today. Was this an R&D program? This was quasi R&D, but quasi for specific applications okay. that we had in mind. And the one that comes to mind where we really applied uh, digital technology was for uh, uh, the bemused. Mm -hmm. early warning system, ballistic early warning system radar. And uh, one of the parts of that system was what was called the radar data conversion data, or RADCON, which was converting a lot of the analog data of a tracking radar into digital data, uh, techniques. Except that the devices we were using were the little vacuum tubes, we, were that, we thought that was great. The only problem is you needed one little vacuum tube, which contained two triodes in it, to uh, implement what is one bit. Wow. Yes, you say wow. It is wow. Uh, because it means that to implement a byte, which is eight bits, you would need eight of these little vacuum tubes which by technology, I'm sure people must say, you must have been crazy to try to implement it that way. But you had no choice. Mm -hmm. And digital technology offers so much distinct advantages. See, one of the problems you were continually fighting with analog devices is maintaining your voltage constant to the value that you want as a reference. Well, if you can digitize that, that goes away. You don't have that problem now. Now you're dealing with digits and widgets, as we used to say. And once you got it in a digit and a widget, it's hard to lose. Uh, with analog devices, you're continually faced with, faced with a problem of changing gain and so forth, which now changes the value of, of things. And you had to have many ways of trying to implement and achieve very stable voltages, which the problem goes away. Another problem in connection with uh, analog devices, <clears throat> in particular peculiar to radars, is this idea when you're tracking something, you're tracking in three coordinates, uh, range, azimuth, and uh, whatever it is, the other one, angle. And, uh, and it used to be implemented using uh, analog devices, which meant you had to maintain very strict stable voltages or your, your reading would be off. The minute you've digitized it, you're away from that problem. Uh, and not only that, you have a problem in implementing things analog-wise because of the drift. Once you, uh, you have to control your gain very strict and things of that sort. Once you've digitized it, it's just a question of zero or one, yes or no. And if your gain varies a little, it doesn't affect you that much. So uh, as a result of all these things that were the advantages, uh, I ended up in that area of the uh, radar technology group. And uh, the first big system we did, besides the Talos, which was mostly uh, analog, uh, was the 
uh, the tracking radar, uh, AFPN-16, it was uh, where we first applied the idea of digital technology, particularly with respect to uh, uh, digitizing the uh, parameter of uh, range, not so much range, but uh, angle. It was, uh, I guess, one of the first applications of a, of a uh, photo angle encoder where you would encode uh, the uh, uh, in digits the position of a, a shaft. Mm -hmm. And that first was applied in, I think, the FPN-16, in which we ended up, that system ended up with being the most precise tracking radar in the world. We were able to, con to uh, uh, track within a fraction or a milliradian, if you know what it is, you know, yeah. a fraction of a milliradian. And the problem you ran into that when you did that is normally if you run with a number system, you go through a bunch of numbers and eventually reach a point where if a, as you go from one number to next number, all the digits change. It's like going from 999 to say 1,000. You go from zeros to one. Well, that was something you couldn't uh, uh, want in connection with a radar or a, a precise system, so to speak, because you'd be having all the bits change at so the slightest move of the, of, the, of the angle of the radar. Mm. So we used what was called a, uh, um, I even forget the name of it. It was a, uh, uh, a system where only one bit at a time would change. And eventually, you end up with not a, a, a coded system, which is not a normal binary system. Mm -hmm. So you had to end up for now a, what today we're seeing trivial, but it would be a, a software problem instead of a hardware problem. You had to come up some way of re-encoding from the standard uh, uh, encoded number to a straight binary. And this became a problem because it would require a certain amount of hardware to, to do that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, getting back to my involvement, is I, I got involved with it and uh, we did apply this digital technology. And what's kind of interesting in this respect that I experienced, uh, we weren't aware yet of how things can grow and grow. Uh, we started out on a program, this was uh, the FPN-16. Uh, or it may have been the uh, early stages of BMUs, where we're going to do a radar data conversion. We were going to convert these analog things into digital mm -hmm. uh, numbers. And we estimated it initially, and we said, well, maybe it'd be a couple of racks of equipment. You know, we thought we were being very generous. Well, as it turned out, our generosity wasn't generous enough. We ended up with about 48 or 45 <laughs> racks of equipment, quite a growth. And we used to sort of josh each other about it, how we ended up with all this equipment. But what was driving this, unfortunately, was the technology. We were trying to implement digital technology using pre-digital devices. For example, as I mentioned, you take a, a little vacuum tube, which we thought was nice and small, one bit. That was one bit because it had, uh, uh, you had two uh, circuits in it, two triodes in, in this tube, and you could implement a bit, which today we think is, you wouldn't even try it. Yeah. And that connection, another thing that uh, was kind of interesting is, uh, you know, in digital technology, you run through a program where you have a, a, set of, a set of bits, which are the control, the, the uh, controller, what to do or not to do. And this is, of course, uh, these days, it's met, uh, stored in a memory of some sort, and you bring out these bytes, bits or bytes, which then tell the controller what to do. But we didn't have such things in those days. And we to, to, for our program, it was not a, uh, uh, a memory stored program. We had... Uh, 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 memory cores, where the way you generated the byte, you had a, a bank of individual memory cores, and then you ran a wire through in a court 
to which sense when it was activated, whether it was activated or not activated, mm. uh, that particular wire, whether that wire was within the core or out of the core. So to get a byte set, you'd have to take, say for the sake of discussion, for one byte, and you would need eight cores, magnetic cores, and then you would thread a wire in and out of the cores to generate the bits of the byte. Mm. Kind of crude. Yeah. It was. <laughs> we didn't think it was at the time. But I remember we did, <clears throat> we, uh, we were using, I think, a thousand <clears throat> uh, uh, instruction application. And one of the applications of the radar was, may have been the, the 60, in the early days. And we had this uh, uh, bank of cores, magnetic cores, and where you had to thread it in and out to degenerate. And we had our program, which the grand number of, I think, a thousand steps in the program itself. Can you imagine writing a program today with a thousand, a three out of the house? <laughs> but that was the technology. Mm -hmm. And it got it to work, and it did work. But eventually, I guess today, it, it just... Mm -hmm. yeah. Somewhere you might find it as an artist. Right, artist. Right. And the other thing I got involved in is, uh, is one of the big problems, and it still is till today, this was in connection with some uh, uh, research and development I got involved in. And it was uh, a three-dimensional display in which you did not need your glasses, believe it or not. We had come up, uh, a group, wherever it was, with the idea uh, that if you would take a horizontal plane mm -hmm. and move it up and down, let's say, and then synchronize that with your time of where the, the particular target was mm -hmm. in time, you could make it appear as a spot when the, the plane was at a certain spot representing the altitude. And then you had the other coordinates. Mm -hmm. And we actually had a, a display we had generated or built, which you could actually see. And just by looking at it, you could see it without any glasses, without anything, where the target was in space. It didn't go too far because it had one disadvantage. And that was it, uh, it could handle uh, uh, small systems, but not big systems. Right. You would need such a big sp yeah. oscillating uh, surface, but it's the, the concept is still there. Maybe one of these days somebody will come back up with some kind of a vibrating uh, membrane that you can, can do it on a large. But that the, I know today that they do have three D television, and you still need the glasses for still it. Need the glasses, yeah. So we haven't progressed very far on that. <laughs> so that was your R and D. One of my R and D projects. I was involved a lot in R and D and a lot in development. Uh, straight development. Okay. Okay. Well, the uh, the big program that I got involved in or came along was in the mid 1950s when RCA uh, uh, landed the ballistic missile early warning system. Mm -hmm. Well, the big threat in those days was ballistic missiles from Russia, a mm -hmm. common enemy. This was the Cold War, and the threat came from uh, <coughs> over the North Pole. Mm -hmm. And the idea was uh, to build some detection system that could catch these missiles if they're coming. Uh, it was early enough that we could react with our anti-ballistic mm -hmm. missile. And the basic system that came out was a, uh, what we call BEMUSE, or the Ballistic Missile Early Warning System. And RCA obtained that job. That time we did win one. But it was a big one. It was the first billion dollar job that had ever been awarded. Wow. And the, uh, I think it state, uh, dates from around the mid 1950s, about 1955, mm. in that period of time. And it involved uh, the tracking radars, which was Miss, uh, Morristown's real specialty. Mm -hmm. And it also involved search radars, which had been uh, subcontracted out to General Electric. See, the, uh, the system involved uh, uh, first that the uh, tracking, a uh, search radar would detect a target. And of course, that was not Morristown's specialty, the search radar. 
And so it, that part of it was subcontracted to GE. And then once the target has been found by the search radar, then your tracking radar uh, would lock on it and then track it in. And the missile, whatever it would then, would ride your tracking radar beam to the target. And that's the part that RCA, of course, RCA had the whole program. They were the program manager for the program. Uh, the hardware part that RCA built was basically the, uh, the tracking radar mm -hmm. and, of course, the controls for it, the control room and things of that sort. Now, how long did that program last? That program started, in, as I say, 1955, <clears throat> the early systems. Uh, were developed, uh, were delivered about towards the 59 mm -hmm. era, in that era. Three systems were built, uh, one for Thule, uh, Iceland, uh, Greenland, one for uh, Barrows, North uh, Alaska, and a third system for somewhere in England. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think the first one to go was the first one to, that be in place, that is, was the one in Thule. Okay. And, uh, uh, and I guess as far as the field testing, the implementation and all that started towards the end of the 50s and then continued on until the 60s. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, they may still be in place, but they would pretty be pretty archaic these days. Yeah. That was 60 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that was um, <coughs> BMUSE, and what did you work on after that? Uh, well, I got involved uh, with, with, uh, at that time, uh, lasers had just been invented. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, evolving a device like that had an appeal to people in the radar business sure. if you could implement that. So we had a uh, uh, research and development uh, program trying to find if we could uh, apply that. And I was involved in this program where we did develop a, a system, an experimental system, mm -hmm. that could be used uh, for tracking, for tracking like a regular radar, except that instead of using, uh, you know, uh, RF energy, another mm -hmm. RF, uh, microwave energy in microwaves, you'd be really using light stuff. Yeah. And we did build a breadboard system where we could actually track something. And this uh, dates to about the early 1960s. And I know that very well because, believe it or not, something happened while we were out, myself and some uh, other people, engineers and so forth, testing the radar. And that is uh, John A. Cady died at that time. Mm. And the word came out. I remember it well because we were out there testing it when the word came out. Have you heard? Have you heard? The president has died. Mm. So that puts us about the early 1960s. Right, 63. Uh, yeah. right. The shortcoming of a uh, laser radar is the fact that you couldn't use it at low altitudes because of weather, clouds, and that. Mm -hmm. A laser doesn't penetrate those, not those that have our day anyway. Right. But still, once you got above the weather for missiles, say you're way above that, it could yeah. have some potential use. That was the thinking behind it. Mm -hmm. If we could develop the technology eventually, uh, that could be used. And what's also interesting, at that point in time, uh, the uh, lasers had been developed, uh, to, they were, you didn't have the solid state lasers that you have today. Mm -hmm. You had these kind of lasers, there were crystals, but there was a kind of limited to the amount of power you can put yeah. into them. Or it was or try to control them as easy as you can today with solid state uh, lasers. But at least the concept was there mm -hmm. if we could get it work. And we did. We did get it work where you could track them. Mm -hmm. And about that time is, I think, when I decided to leave Morristown, uh, uh, RCA. Okay. I went down to uh, Westinghouse mm -hmm. for a while. So, how long did you spend at Westinghouse? I was there about two or three years. Okay. Yeah. And then you. Came back I, I, no, I didn't come back directly. I had some other assignments I went to, okay. and eventually I did come back to RCA. And when I did come back, by that time, digital technology had improved a lot. Mm. 
and I worked for a while on the uh, military computer, the field computer. Uh, there was a project that RCA had where uh, they were trying to develop a computer which would be a, like a multi-purpose computer for use by all branches of the service. Okay. Uh, see, the whole idea of programming had evolved and things of that sort, where now they were stored in memory, right. as they are today, for one thing. And secondly, the use of memories had evolved also. We had better uh, schemes of memory devices. Uh, and this, uh, I worked on that for maybe a couple of years, but then something else came along that I was interested. I had worked for a while. I was way away from RCA on uh, FAA programs. Mm -hmm. Okay, and RCA had this program where they were the uh, technical advisors to the FAA for a program involving uh, the new concept that was called the Advanced Automation Program. Okay. Where there were, the government was going to change the way they implemented the tracking of radars, not radars, of airplanes and mm -hmm. things of that sort. And RCA was a technical advisor. Oh, okay. And I uh, was assigned to that. And I worked on that for several years. In fact, uh, one of the big questions at that time, issues, remember now, RCA is the advisor. So one of the big questions was the FAA had been using black and white displays. Remember, now you're the time-wise, you're in the vintage of uh, the 1980s mm. and maybe later, late 80s. And by that time, color vision was an established thing. Sure. But believe it or not, they were using... Uh, black and white monitors in the control top, in the uh, air traffic control area. And the question was, plus a lot of other reasons, they had more uh, older technology. Mm -hmm. They were, and they had this program, the Advanced Automation Program, to change the whole approach to mm -hmm. how you uh, uh, controllers tracked the airplanes, things of that sort. And one of the questions that came up, because they were using, believe it or not, mono, uh, monocolor uh, monitors, you know, green mm -hmm. monitors, color, single color, should be colored with a color. Yeah. And they had asked RCA to investigate this. And I headed up their team personally. And we went all over and, uh, RCA because RCA, but you know, they made tubes and things of that sort. They come out with a big report. We got we, we really made a pretty good presentation. Mm -hmm. They were very impressed. RCA got, <laughs> in fact, cited for a good job, a job well done. But the bottom line was, that we go to color. Oh, sure. <laughs> but you wouldn't believe it that there were people within the FAA who insisted we shouldn't go to color. It's not worth the cost. Mm. How do you like that? Wow. Despite, you know, as we look at it today, now this again, hindsight's always better than fourth. You would never think of staying with mm -hmm. Monroe. Yeah. But there were people who are, and there are, they're concerned, believe it or not, that this is a, a you were kind of uh, surprising coming from uh, government people. They were concerned about cost. <laughs> that the, the colored uh, the monitors would be so much more expensive. And what did you gain for and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Well, we gave them a good argument. Yeah. Okay, so that was the FAA. And that, yes, and that's yeah. about the time I left. I was at that time for a time. By that time, okay. uh, uh, RCA was no longer existence. It was right. now General Electric. Came GE. Um, let's talk about your uh, co-workers. What, yes. was, what were they like? Oh, I liked them very much. Got along well. We enjoyed them very good. Mm -hmm. And even maybe we were socially together. Now, of course, a lot of us were engineers. I had background in uh, ham radio. Mm -hmm. So we have some of that much in common with other engineers, okay. maybe uh, even uh, non-electricals, uh, maybe uh, mechanicals and things mm -hmm. so. And uh, every year we would have a special uh, ham radio fest. I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, they run annually sort of a, a simulated situation where there's no communications that has broken down, and ham radio comes in and does mm -hmm. uh, you know, all the communication. Cool. And you have a competition where you're trying to make as many contacts in 24 hours as possible. So we had a crew there, including myself, who on that particular day would 
go out in the field near the plant, and we'd have a radio station set up, and we'd be working it all around the clock for 24 hours. So this was coming. just more of a hobby? Or a hobby, social. that's correct. It wasn't really a work-related, it was a hobby. Did you socialize a lot <clears throat> with your co-workers? To a degree, well, to a degree, yes, and to a degree, no. I, uh, we, I socialized to whatever things may be going into plants or mm -hmm. with the group that I was with. I wasn't able to socialize too much outside because at that time, as well as uh, working, I had decided, see, I was involved in this whole new technology. Mm. And I decided, well, if I'm going to have to do this, I have to learn it. Mm -hmm. So I started to take courses at Penn, nighttime courses, because RCA encouraged this by mm -hmm. uh, the way we would refund the uh, cost of it. So I started to take these uh, digital technology courses at mm -hmm. Penn, and at the same time, I said, well, if I'm going to take them, I might as well, as well work them into a program, sure. which I did, and mm -hmm. I finally got a PhD in that field. So I was busy, okay. plus I was recently married. You know, I was like a one arm uh, painter. I was married, raised a family, working overtime with them, same time going to school. Yeah. That was kind of busy. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. What about your supervisors? What were they like? I was very pleased. I had a supervisor. I got along terrific with him. He's, he's one of I didn't particularly, you know, so when you meet a guy, you like, you get along well. He's the one who eventually got me for promotion. I don't know why. Yeah. But I got along very well with him. Very nice guy. Mm -hmm. I liked him. But one of the, I won't say unfortunate, maybe unfortunate for RCA, he eventually left the company. He went down to uh, Florida to uh, Harris and took an executive position down in Harris. Mm -hmm. And the last I heard, after he'd been down there a while, that he had that called some illness or something passed away. Oh. Yeah, strange. Yeah. And the fellow's name was Henry Lesser. People would recognize him. He's well known when he was at RCA. What was his name? Henry Lesser. Okay. Henry he used Lesser. to live uh, not too far from the plant. Mm. Um, what was the um, what was the work environment like? Did you have what you needed? Um, did you feel like you were appreciated? No, I think we were. Although mm -hmm. you have to keep in mind that we were in a new plant right. that when we were at Morristown. And therefore they had you know, they had built it and designed it with the intent that it's going to be used by engineers or engineering mm -hmm. types and also for building big systems. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think most people, I, I found none who was dissatisfied you know, with the lay of the land and what we had to work with, very dissatisfied, mm -hmm. very satisfied. The big problem we had, and uh, this is, the union problem. Mm -hmm. Union in this sense, uh, you know, you're building something, and so this is in connection, particularly from an engineer's point of view. Yeah. You're building something, you're meeting, uh, trying to meet a schedule, and usually a tight schedule. Mm -hmm. And at first stage, you need, to, you had to sort of breadboard your equipment, your concepts, right. and test them out. Right. And often, you would do something, and then, and then you maybe would want to move it down the hall to another lab mm -hmm. to do some common testing, wouldn't not. And you couldn't do it. You couldn't move it yourself. You had to go get special mm -hmm. handlers, material handlers. The old problem. I know we couldn't do it. We had to wait. But that was a thing that I had to complain that yeah. I would complain about. Yeah. And I don't think it was of RCA's making as much the way, in, you know, in industry in general. And mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What, um, how do you think RCA was looked on in the community? Oh, I think they were looked at with a lot of respect. Mm -hmm. I think they, they were... You know, you used to tell people you work for RCA, they would, they would kind of, yeah, great. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, in that sense, RCA commanded a lot of good feelings and a lot of respect. So, and of course, a lot of them were RCA people themselves. Right, right. <laughs> That's what I was going to get to. There's been an inference that maybe RCA even changed South Jersey. Do you oh, agree it, with that? Yes, in the, in the sense that, uh, one, it provided a lot of jobs, you know, and mm -hmm. good paying jobs. The other, in the sense that it brought in a lot of talented and uh, highly trained people, mm -hmm. you know, from outside the local area. And a lot of the workers that I would have, you know, they'd be from this part of the country or that part of the country. It was similar like to being in the Army, you know, where they were for different parts of the country. So it, in that respect, I think it, it did a lot in diversifying. 
And some of the people eventually came and lived here. Others, no, they came here, worked, and they went back where they're from. Mm -hmm. Similar as you have in the service. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, in all my uh, travels and so forth in South Church and other places, wherever I mentioned that I worked for RCA, they always looked on you with respect. Mm -hmm. And gra not gratitude, it's sort of a, a, a feeling that, yeah, great guy. Mm -hmm. you know, I wish I were there. Like, mm -hmm. They wish they were there. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you think our customers looked on us? Well, the customers I can, uh, well, there are two kinds of customers. One is the government customers, mm -hmm. the ones I had most of, uh, contact right. with. And of course, the other is the customers in the sense of the TV people who bought mm -hmm. RCA sets. In both cases, I think they all looked on them very favorably. Mm -hmm. RCA, you know, make was always considered a, a good buy. Mm -hmm. you know? And as far as the government, we, uh, I never heard any derogatory remarks or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And as I say, in one particular case, with this uh, FAA program, they even gave us a big commendation. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I asked you what was the best thing about working for RCA, what would you say? The best thing? Yeah. Now you're getting personal, <laughs> in this sense. For me, I'm a Hamiltonian, born and raised here. Oh, wow. And I, it's nice to be close to your work. And uh, when I left RCA and went down to Westinghouse, I was living down in the uh, Baltimore, Annapolis area. And every time a holiday came along, you know, I had to pack up everything to mm -hmm. come back home to see the parents. I have five kids, by the way, as you can see. Mm -hmm. uh, and after a while, that gets tiring mm -hmm. and whatnot. And it's nice to be close to home. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, that I was close to my family, it was a big plus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think uh, probably other people felt that way too. Okay. But sometimes they couldn't do anything about it. I had, uh, and this doesn't, <laughs> I had a technician working for me. And he was forever late. I won't get his name. <laughs> mm, okay. for, and, uh, and I would get that because he was working in my group. I got to do something about it. And I'd be ten times telling him, you gotta do something. And it wasn't coming from very far. Morristown. He used to come from the west side of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So to come to Morristown, he had to come all through the Philadelphia traffic, okay, and then to Morristown. And he would never be it always be late. And not only that, being a technician, he was on a time clock. He had a clock in. And I kept telling him, I said, Why don't you move? Well, no, I got my roots, I got my family there, I don't want to move. <laughs> so family carries a lot of weight. Yeah. yeah. What would you say would be the worst thing about working for RCA? Worst thing? I don't know if you can call it the worst thing, but it was something that I was a little bit disappointed in, let's put it that way. It may have been a, a contributing factor to me leaving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been working in different things, uh, digital technology and, and, and uh, research and development and so mm -hmm. forth. And I forget time-wise, it must have been in the 60s, mid-60s. They had an opening in another area, which I didn't particularly want to go to. Because they needed a unit manager there. Mm -hmm. And they figured I had the technology in background, but I didn't want to go. But they forced me to go. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the manager above that, I guess they needed it. And, Mm -hmm. And then I got pulled out from a, a position that I enjoyed and liked to go to the other one that was it wasn't a bad position, just I wanted to do the other one. Right, right. So it kind of aggravated me a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's about the worst case. But it wasn't a big thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, I was very happy. Mm. Um, if I asked you to sum up your time at RCA, just a job or... How would you sum it up? Well, <clears throat> no, I think it was more than just a job. I think it's, I'd say more of an experience. Mm. That's what it was. I, you know, it was a, I learned a lot. I also gave a lot, too, mm -hmm. you know, and so forth. And there was at times very hectic, you know, when we first started to uh, uh, get into digital technology. I think I mentioned earlier about... Uh, how we went from what we thought was going to be two racks of equipment to 40 racks, 45 right. racks. Something else went with that as the personnel. We went from a small group that must have had about 30 or 40 people. Mm -hmm. 
which meant a lot of paperwork for me, you know, yeah. because you have to read them and uh, supervise them and mm-hmm. things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I still, it was part of the job. I, I didn't begrudge it or anything. You know, I mm-hmm. just accepted the challenge. Mm-hmm. Uh, overall, I always look back on the, those years as you know, good, happy years. Mm-hmm. Learned a lot, gave a lot. Mm-hmm. You know. We uh, we've heard several times a reference to the RCA family. Does that mean anything to you? Yes and no. It means yes, yeah. We did have a sense, a sense of family when we were there, mm-hmm. together, working together. You know, we, uh, we empathized, and then actually, in my cases, very often you go out on dates together and stuff mm-hmm. like that with your fellow, that the fellow worker, as you go dating two, two other girls or something like that. Uh, and it does hold. I think there was a certain amount of feeling of bondship there that you're in ours. And even today, if you go to somebody and you see where he, Course, yeah, you feel a certain amount of kinship, mm-hmm. and uh, they have this uh, monthly meeting of the uh, retirees. Mm-hmm. I used to go to that, and I used to enjoy them. Mm-hmm. My problem now it's so far to go to. Yeah. Uh, it's not, you know, you, but I wish it were closer. I would go attend them. Mm-hmm. But I think uh, there is a, a certain bond of feeling when you run into somebody, and he says, "I work for RCA." Oh, yeah. Right away, you got something to talk about. Right, right. Yeah. And a lot to talk. If he happens to be from Morristown, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, is there anything else that you can recall that we haven't covered? That you, uh, you know, any anything that happened, incidents, stories, or anything like that through your career? Well, not the kind of things that may be a general interest, maybe more of a personal interest. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, but I think uh, the fact that uh, we uh, we were a group that started out as a small group, mm-hmm. and in this way, I, I think it, I, it's a little bit on the negative side. We were a small group in, in uh, Building 53. We were a small group where you could really knew each other. And then when we expanded at Morristown, it became so large, you lost contact with a lot of people that you used to, didn't have, you know, Mm -hmm. new faces and no contact. Mm -hmm. That was a little negative, I think. But it's part of growth. Mm -hmm. It's part of growth. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, on the whole, though, it was a very good experience. I have nothing, I I have no grudges against him or anything. If I think it's all positive. Okay. I wish I could see more of the guys that I worked with. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>